i'm really, really excited for the first speaker that we have here today whose name whose name is gloria mark, dr. gloria mark. she's coming from u c. irvine she is just one of the world's leading researchers on all topics of attention and activities in the workplace um all kinds of things she's been doing. she recently did a sabbatical at microsoft research where she has figured out exactly kind of how people are spending their time during their day, how they're interrupted, how they react to that. Uh, her papers have been, you know, my background, um, I think I introduced myself, I'm Jared Goralnik, uh, CEO of a company called AwayFind. And at our company, when we were doing research on how people can kind of get away from their computers, but also be found with important things, that's what our product does, we were trying to figure out how do you manage interruptions, how do people handle workflow, and we always ended up coming back to her research. Uh, so I hosted another conference called Inbox Love, and we had her keynote that two years ago, and she was just amazing. Um, she recently had papers accepted at CHI and several other events, and just, we are so delighted to have her in this setting. Unfortunately. So, uh, as Jared mentioned, this is my, my second time uh, giving a talk that, at an event that, that Jared organized, and Jared knows how to throw a good party. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a topic that I'm very interested in, constant connectivity. And, uh, you know, just to show you the range of kinds of uh, uh, places and ways that people use cell phones, th this is the Cambodian monk in the center uh, at Angkor Wat, this picture I took. These are, uh, I had the pleasure of having dinner with these young seminarians in Rome using their cell phones. This is a gentleman in Qatar. I was just in Qatar about two weeks ago. So just to you know, give you a sense that all, all over the world, people are having the same kinds of problem. Now, my, my starting point is that uh, we are all what's called monochronic. And you know, my background is in psychology, so that's the, the approach that I'm taking to study this field. Monochronic refers to the idea that we like to do tasks from start to finish you know, without being interrupted. And that's the way I am, that's the way most people are. Some people are polychronic, they get a thrill of switching between different tasks. But the point here is that most of us are hardwired to be monochronic, but we're living in a digital age that's, uh, that's leading us to be polychronic, to switch tasks, having multiple devices, having information stored uh, in multiple places, even on the same device. So one of the questions that I've been uh, pursuing uh, actually over the last 10 years is uh, understanding uh, attention and focus in this digital age. And one of the main questions that I've been asking is how much do people multitask anyways when they're working with digital media? And in particular, I also am interested in how this constant connectivity with digital information affects our mood and our stress. So this is a fairly new area that, that I've been um, approaching. And so uh, also associated with this idea of mood and stress at work is looking at engagement. Why is it that some digital activity people are highly engaged with and others they're not? So that's kind of an overview of the kind of research questions that I've been looking at. Now, you know, a lot of uh, researchers study uh, interruptions and multitasking and attention focus in laboratory settings. And one thing that I do is I look at it in the wild. So uh, I'll show you shortly the, the methods that I use, but I like to look at people's uh, attention focus, the way that they switch tasks in their real world environments. And so to this end, I've looked at two different kinds of groups. So I've looked at information workers uh, who are in high tech companies. And the reason I look at high tech companies is because I'm primarily interested in people who are using an array of different kinds of digital media, people who are working on a number of different projects. And so from that criteria, it's, it's really easy to find companies that fit that, uh, that requirement. 
And then more recently, I've had a, a large grant from the National Science Foundation to look at people in the millennial generation. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, why the millennial generation? Well, number one, uh, it's the most connected generation. These are people in the ages of roughly 19 through 29. Uh, they are the largest users of uh, the internet, social media, and they, importantly, they are the ones who grew up with the internet. And they are also the future information workers uh, in our society, and they're already entering the workforce uh, rapidly. And there's probably a few, you know, maybe there's some millennial generation folks here. So to date, we've, uh, we've tracked about maybe 80 or so information workers in depth. I'll explain that in a moment. And we just finished this week tracking 124 uh, college students. That's a subset of the millennial generation. And we, we track them for seven days, all waking hours, so that we can really capture a good snapshot of their uh, uh, digital media use. Now, here's, here's the methods that I use, and I, and I really need to uh, explain this to you so that the data that I show you will make a lot of sense. So I use what's called precision tracking. Now, I used to uh, do ethnographic studies where we would follow people around with stopwatches, and every time they switched activities, you know, we would time it. So we would, you know, someone would open up a Word document, you'd click the start time, and then they'd switch to uh, email, stop time for Word, start time for email. You know, so that, that was the way that we were collecting data. Then um, a few years ago, I was introduced to sensors, and I was just totally sold on sensors. It's it's a you know very low cost way of collecting a lot of data with precision. So um, so I now use sensors uh, to try to capture data. Um, use this, this laser pointer. Here we go. Uh, let me start here. This is actually a scene. Does anyone know what movie this is a scene from here? Does anyone know? It's called Kitchen Stories. It's a Swedish film. It's a satire on ethnography. Highly recommendable. Uh, so we do computer logging and phone logging. Uh, this is a heart rate monitor, and this measures what's called heart rate variability. This is used in medical studies. It's well validated, and it's a measure of stress. Uh, here, whoops. Uh, this, this is called a sociometric badge, and what this uh, does is it uses infrared to detect when you're interacting with someone else, when you're in a certain range face-to-face, -face, so we can get, face, you know, a measure of face-to-face interaction. Um, this is called a sense cam, and some of my data will be talking about that. That takes continual photos about once every 10 or 15 seconds, and then we apply software to it to do face detection to see whether a person is present or absent in, in the photo. And that's a proxy for the amount of face-to-face -face interaction that a person experiences. Uh, this here is called an affective acute sensor. It measures galvanic skin response, skin conductivity. That's also a measure associated with stress. And we've used all kinds of other sensors. Here we used chair sensors because the ergonomics literature shows that when you lean back in a chair, you tend to be more relaxed. And let's see what else. We also had uh, set up sensors on the desktop so we can look at things like paper shuffling. Um, the first result that I want to talk about was, is a fairly old result. And it was a result that we uh, got from doing the, the early ethnographic uh, studies, and this is probably something some of you are familiar with, that we find if we just look at everybody's activities, uh, and this was done in the workplace, how often do they switch on average? And it's about three minutes. If we take away formal meetings, because you know if you're in a meeting, you're a prisoner at that meeting, right? So. You're, you're there, and, and uh, that's not fair to include that in the data. We also uh, removed personal information, such as you know going to the restroom or lunch, and, and some unknown events. 
that we couldn't categorize. Now this three minute result is actually very robust because we've done this with other, uh, in other settings and it's just kind of amazing. You know, we got two minutes and 59 seconds. There's no statistical difference. However, this includes interactions and interactions tend to be much, much longer than screen switching and I'll talk about that shortly. So we find that people spend about three minutes on any task before switching or being interrupted. The, the next result, this is also an early result, was that you know we asked the question, well, maybe switching isn't so bad if you're working on the same project. So I, I'm an academic, I write papers, and if I'm uh, you know writing a Word document and then I talk with a colleague and then I read something on the web and it's all the same uh, project, well, maybe it's not so bad if I switch. There, it's not really a cognitive switch. So we clustered these activities into projects, what we called working spheres, spheres of work. First we find people spend, they have about 12 different projects on average. That's about right for me. And uh, we find that people switch about every 10 and a half minutes uh, in any sphere of work before switching. So that's not a very long time. There's a cost to reorient, and there's a cost to get into a project, uh, you know, if you've, if you've been away from it. So 10 and a half minutes is not very long. Uh, and then, uh, again, from the early work, we asked how long does it take people to resume work, given that they've been interrupted. And we only considered work that was interrupted and resumed on the same day. And we didn't consider the last hour of work. We didn't think it was fair, because what if you're interrupted at 4.30 and you leave at 5, right? So we, we just considered uh, you know, what we thought was a fair comparison. And we found good news and bad news. And the good news is that about 82% of interrupted work is resumed on the same day. That's not bad. That, that's pretty good. The bad news is that it's not resumed right away. It takes people an average about 23 minutes and 15 seconds to resume work uh, if they've been interrupted from it. Now, if we unpack that a little bit, remember I told you the working spheres, people spend about 10 and a half minutes. So what happens when people resume work? Well, you move into another sphere of work, then you move into a second sphere of work and then you go back to the first one. This is an average pattern. I'm talking about averages. So interruptions are nested, right? You get interrupted into another task. You get interrupted from that into another task. And then you go back to the first one. So think about the cognitive shift that's involved. And we also find that people, you know, there's two kinds of interruptions. There's not just external interruptions. And a lot of people who work in this area of research just focus on external interruptions. But about half the time, this is from the observe, you know, we got this from observing people. Uh, people have this very strange phenomenon where they suddenly stop what they're doing in the middle of a Word document and turn and read email, right? And it, this is self-interruptions. And people self-interrupt almost as much as they're doing external interruptions. Um, I want to stop here for a second and say to you that I'm just presenting to you the point results. And you should understand that underlying all of these results, there's lots and lots of data and lots of uh, uh, data analyses. And what I'm reporting here are statistically significant results, just so that you know. If I were to present you the, the actual data, it, it would be overwhelming. So we then uh, wondered about patterns of interruptions. And so we divided our data up into one hour time windows. And we found something really interesting, that when there's patterns of high interruptions, they, and then these high interruptions wane, what happens is people continue to self-interrupt. And it's very strange, and it suggests to me that people are habituated to be in an interruption mode. So when the external interruptions slow down, people keep interrupting themselves. And in a laboratory experiment, I found that when people were in a condition of being interrupted, 
in comparison to a baseline condition without interruptions for doing a task, that people actually sped up their work. And so it suggests to me that when people are in an environment where they expect interruptions to come, they compensate, right? And it's because of opportunity cost. We have a limited amount of time during the day to accomplish things. And so, you know, we speed up to be able to accomplish those things when we expect interruptions to happen. Uh, you know, we always interview people after we study them, and the number one uh, complaint and, or reason that people uh, claim for being uh, self-interrupted and also externally interrupted from notifications is email. And I like to use the analogy that email is like zombies because, you know, the zombies keep coming and you keep killing them and they keep coming and you keep killing them and the email keeps coming and you keep deleting it and it keeps coming and you keep deleting them. It took me six years to find an organization that was willing to let its employees be cut off from email for a period of five days, one work week. We found it and we, we strapped them up with heart rate monitors and logged their uh, digital activity. And we found that during that week, in comparison to a baseline, we found that people are significantly less stressed without email they focused significantly longer on any particular computer screen, right, when they did not have email. And correspondingly, they switched at a lower frequency, switching between screens. And another result, and this comes actually, this comes from several studies, and I'm gonna go into it a little bit more, email puts people into a bad mood. We all say that, we found this empirically. Uh, I'd like to talk about gender. So let me ask you, using the criteria of uh, having, uh, being less likely to self-interrupt and resuming work faster, who do you think does a better job of that? How many of you think men are better at doing that? Raise your hands. How many of you think women are better at doing this? How many of you think there's no statistical difference? Okay. So uh, the answer is women. And the, the women in our sample worked in, first of all, in more working spheres than men. And they were less likely to interrupt themselves and they experienced fewer interruptions overall. And they were more likely to resume work faster. Uh, or I should say more likely to resume work on the same uh, day that was interrupted, so 87% uh, compared to about 81%. But there's also interesting results concerning mood and gender. And so women are actually happier in the workplace than men. This might be a surprise. And, uh, and this may not be a surprise that women are actually more engaged in work than, than their male counterparts. Okay, so now, now I'm gonna talk uh, f from this point on, on the work that we've been uh, doing using sensors. And one of the things that I'm really interested in is patterns of attention throughout the work day. Now most people who study uh, interruptions and multitasking, including myself, we have always uh, put our focus on interruptions. And so this is a reverse perspective. Instead of focusing on the interruptions, we focus on the aspect of focus. And so to this end, let me explain to you uh, an additional method that we used to capture focus. Uh, this is called experience sampling. This is a probe. And so people receive this probe uh, throughout the workday. We had certain decision rules that we used, but it appeared to be random to the participants. And um, this is an approach that's used uh, in, a, in a number of other domains. For example, uh, Sheiks and Mihaly, who studies flow, uses this technique a lot to capture the idea of flow. Um, let's use this pointer. This, this horizontal axis represents affect, that means mood, and it ranges from positive to negative. 
This vertical axis represents arousal, not at all aroused, to highly aroused. People have to click at that point in the grid that best expresses how they feel right now when this probe comes up. And, you know, it, it takes about two seconds to do this, even less than two seconds when people get accustomed to it. Then we ask them, uh, did you just have a face-to-face -face interaction? And then we ask them, how engaged were you in, in the thing you were just doing? And how challenged were you in the thing you were just doing? So these dimensions of challenge and engagement, I'm gonna talk about right now. So we took these two dimensions and we created this, this theoretical framework. When people are high challenged and high engaged, we call them in a state of focus. And um, for those of you who do data crunching, we, we normalize the data. And we just took the top third and the bottom third of the data. Here, when people are not challenged and they're highly engaged, we call this rote work. Rote work is mechanical work. It's like filling up forms. When you play solitaire, you're doing rote work, right? You're really engaged, but it's not challenging. When people are not engaged and not challenged, we call this a state of being bored. And when people are highly challenged but not engaged, we call this being frustrated. So an uh, example of frustration is a software developer who just can't solve the bug. Now, strangely, uh, and surprisingly, in all of our data, we only found seven instances that fell into our frustrated category. So we I disregard uh, this data from this point on. So here's uh, some things that we found. So if we, if we average the data over participants and we look at their patterns of uh, these different attentional states throughout the workday, we find that a uh, focus, you know, people don't enter the workplace in a state of focus. It takes them time to ramp up. That's this black line. They peak, you know, right before lunch, and then they peak again about three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, people, if you look at the, the blue line, that's the board distribution, you know, people are pretty bored when they first come into the workplace. Then boredom peaks again right after lunch and then uh, drop step when, when people go to work. Road work is kind of a fairly uniform distribution uh, throughout the middle of the work day. If we look at valence, valence means mood, right? Positive and negative mood. Remember I showed you that, that horizontal dimension on the probe. We find something here that, that was surprising, at least to me. We find that people are happiest when they do road work. I thought, I thought they were going to be happiest when they were focused and engaged. Well, they're not. Now, remember, if you recall, when they're doing rote work, they are engaged, but they're not challenged. And they're also happiest. And so let me uh, break this down a little bit. So if we look at given, that, given all the ratings that people gave of focus, you see here that um, they're happy, right, about half the time. And then here, they're, they're stressed, right, about, you know, a little more than a quarter of a time. And if we look at all the times that people are experiencing rote work, they're even more happier, and they're even less stressed. And if we look at the times that people are in a bad mood, you know, most, uh, sorry, that they're bored, most of the time when they're bored, right, almost half the time, they're really in a bad mood. So now let me talk about uh, online and offline interactions. So uh, we were really interested to understand what makes people happier in the workplace when they do when they have a face-to-face -face interaction or when they have an online interaction. And since uh, Facebook is uh, one of the most prevalent forms of online interaction in the workplace, we decided that we would compare face-to-face and Facebook. So now let me pose the question to you. If, uh, if you consider interactions at the time they occur, right, what do you think people are happiest in doing? Are they happier doing face-to-face -face 
or are they happier when they do Facebook? So how many of you think face-to-face -face at the time that the interactions occur? How many of you think Facebook? Okay, interesting. The answer is face-to-face. -face. So people are happiest at the time they occur. Now, we also then ask what makes people happier at the end of the day? Now this is an important question because the mood that you have at the end of the day is the mood that you bring home to you. So there are carryover effects, right? And if you're in a bad mood at the end of the day, people, you know, research shows that people bring this bad mood home. And if you're happy, you know, you, you have a carryover effect of being uh, in a good mood when you go home. Now, how many of you think that at the end of the day when people reflect back over, uh, over their day, how many of you think the more face-to-face -face interaction they've had, the happier they were at the end of the day? Okay. How many of you think the more Facebook interaction they've had, the happier they were at the end of the day? The answer is Facebook. And the reason, I believe, is because an underlying covariate, that means an, another variable that correlated with Facebook use, is being engaged in work. When people were engaged in work, they tended to use Facebook. And why is that the case? Well, when people do Facebook, they, they do uh, what I call grazing behavior, like cows do grazing. Um, consider this, if you're really engaged in what you're doing, uh, you don't want to have a face-to-face -face interaction because there's a social commitment. When you're in a face-to-face -face interaction, you know, there's a greeting ritual, then there's the interaction and a parting ritual. You can't do this quickly, right? When, you, when you're doing Facebook, you're in control of that interaction. You can go in and out of Facebook really quickly. You, can, you have control over that interaction. And that's why we think what's going on is that it's not just the Facebook, but the Facebook may be a reflection of being really engaged in work. Right? And Facebook affords a break, a quick break from this engagement. So now I, now I want to switch and talk about our work with uh, the millennial generation. And as I mentioned to you, this is uh, it's a very fascinating generation. It's, it's just remarkable because it's, it's young people who grew up with the Internet. And they, they don't know life uh, before the internet. Uh, it is the most connected uh, generation. And there's roughly about 80 million millennials uh, in the US. So I mentioned to you that uh, we, we just completed a study where we tracked millennials. You know, we, we had them wear heart rate monitors to measure stress. We logged their digital activity. We gave them probes. Uh, we uh, asked, you know, we gave them end of day surveys. We just asked a lot of information so that we could try to capture a comprehensive picture of how they use social media. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is data from the first 48 people because we collected the data in two phases. And the first thing I want to talk about is stress. And here's what we find that if we look at just total computer usage and we control for all possible stressors that we can think of for these young people, uh, we find a significant relationship between the total amount of time people spend on the computer and stress. And when I say we controlled for whatever we could think of that could control stress, we controlled for GPA and course load time in the academic quarter, gender, uh, you know, all these different things, major, and we still find this significant relationship. Now, we, we did a model to try to predict stress. We put all the variables that we had captured into the model to see what would be the best fitting model, so the most predictive variables for stress. And here's what we find. We find that computer duration is positively associated with stress. The amount of window switching is positively associated. The more switching, 
that people do, the more stress they experience. We find that actually uh, the more Facebook use that these young people did, the less stress they experienced. And then if we look at all other social media, uh, we also find there's a negative relationship between uh, the amount of social media they use and stress. Uh, the more time they spend on academic sites, the less stress they experience. And the older they are when they first started using the internet, the less stressed they are. Okay. Now, um, it may be a completely unfair comparison to compare the millennials with information workers. You know, the information workers are in the workplace, they have all kinds of different uh, pressures, um, but it's okay, I'm gonna go ahead and make this comparison uh, anyways. And if we just, if we don't look at the interaction and we just look at the total amount of time they p spend on the screen, we find that college students spend a shorter duration on average, about 48 seconds, compared to information workers, about 77 seconds. That's about one third shorter duration on average when, when using ju just the computer. And so that's uh, perhaps a trend that we will see that, that may continue. Now, you know, we always, uh, we always interview people and we ask them, you know, why do you think you switch? What's going on? And um, one theme that merged, which is really quite interesting, is that, and these are the millennials, uh, they report, you know, I don't have control over it, right? One person says, it's just encoded or something. Another person says, well, I do it so that I feel like I'm not wasting time. It gives me something to do. Another person said, all of a sudden stuff happens, the next thing you know, an hour has passed and you've been on YouTube. Another person says, well, it's not usually not something that one intends to do, but something you find yourself doing. So these are just uh, illustrative comments. Um, you know, we have lots and lots of other comments that are along these lines. Okay, so uh, let me try to uh, summarize the, the results of the millennials. So we find that uh, the more time they spend on computers and the more multitasking they do defined by switching computer screens, the higher is their stress. Uh, we also find that, um, well, let, let me try to uh, give my interpretation of why I think this is contributing to stress. So uh, when you have to switch window, when you do switch windows very quickly, um, it creates uh, what's called a cognitive load. You have to continually reorient. You have to reorient your attention, but you also have to use what's called cognitive resources to figure out where you were, right? To, to restore the context. And people have a limited amount of attentional resources to expend, and if you, exceed that threshold of attentional resources that we have, then you know, this can lead to stress. Now one thing that's really important to consider, we found this association of total computer usage and stress, but correlation does not imply causality. That's really important to remember. We cannot say that the total amount of time on the computer is causing stress. We can't say that. It could be that people are stressed to begin with, and that's leading them to go to the computer, perhaps to use social media or uh, go to chat rooms or whatever. So it's really important to consider that. We need to do more research to figure out the uh, direction of that association. And uh, to summarize the results of attention, mood, and work, we find that um, uh, and, and this is actually uh, fair, fairly new work, that when people are doing boring work or rote work, uh, they, they tend to be more susceptible to interruptions. We also find that when people are focused, they, it doesn't yield the best mood, right? And we see that with, uh, with email, when people, um, this is in a, a 
paper that I have, uh, when people are doing email, they tend to be in a bad mood. Uh, they also tend to be focused, right? The two go hand in hand. And as I showed you, people are happiest doing rote work. Now, the, the methodology uh, that I showed you using sensors and using the probes and using these end of day surveys, coupled with um, the theoretical framework of engagement and challenge, is, is a, a kind of uh, is, what is a method that I think can be used to design interventions, right? To detect when people are stressed, when their attention is, is not focused, and to help people create a better balance in the workplace. Now, let me uh, present to you a, this is a work in progress, and I, I change this all the time, and uh, you know, I rearrange these concepts, I change the concepts. This is the, the current state of, of this model as of today. And this seems to be a, a phenomena where stress is just self-perpetuating. And so let me start at the top here. You know, people have access to information. And you know, one of the goals in the field of human-computer interaction, the field that I'm in, is to make, uh, to make it very seamless to uh, switch and capture information. But, you know, the irony is that this seamlessness and this ease of accessing information makes it very easy for people to switch screens, right? It's very tempting to find information uh, on the web. It's, it's at your fingertips. And this leads to habituation, right? Because I talked about this idea of high external interruptions being followed by high self-interruptions, and it suggests it could be habitual. This in turn, you know, if people are really switching so fast and it's habitual, people could be susceptible to distraction. And when you're, when you're switching so rapidly, as I explained, you know, you just have less attentional resources that you can devote to work. This leads to accumulated stress. You know, stress is cumulative. You don't just experience stress for a few minutes and then it goes away. Stress is cumulative. It builds up over the day and it also builds up over um, weeks and months. And people can get very stressed. So it's, it's, it's very hard to get rid of cumulative stress. In fact, um, there's, you know, the, the, there are very interesting studies that are done in Europe. You know, in Europe, people have uh, five to six weeks of vacation. This is standard, and, and I lived in Germany for, for nine years where, you know, this became just a part of our life. And um, it, it takes about two weeks before people can begin to feel the effects of, of a vacation, right? For stress to begin to wear off. And in this country, most workplaces give people, what, two weeks vacation. Uh, you know, especially if you're starting out. And even then, many people don't use their vacations. So this is not a good thing. Okay. So with that, uh, I would like to thank you for your focused attention. And I would also like to thank my sponsor, National Science Foundation. These are just some of the field sites that, have, that I've worked with. The other ones prefer to remain anonymous. And I would also like to thank our participants. So, and I, I'd love to hear your comments. Thank you. So we do have time for about 10 minutes of questions. So those of you that have any, um, if you can speak up, then we hopefully won't need a microphone. But feel free to say your name, introduce yourself, and then ask a question. You're in the back, sir. Hi, uh, thank you. My name is John Maloney. I was curious if you, your uh, research population was primarily vocational workers or managerial workers, or a mixture of both? Uh, it was a variety. So we, we had different work roles. So the, um, the results that I talked about that showed focus, patterns of focus and boredom, that was a combination of three categories primarily. So researchers, administrators, and managers. So we've, we've always had a variety of work roles. In the early, uh, ethnographic results where we were timing people with stopwatches, that there were about six different categories of uh, workers. The only difference, and I've looked to see if there are differences, there are really minor differences. 
Maybe one major difference is that software developers tend to spend about a minute longer on average on their uh, on a, a computer screen compared to other work roles. But that's that's about the biggest difference that I find. There there are other minor differences. Um, so quick follow up in the uh, patterns of engagement and focus. Did you examine like this per day, or did you look at it across the week? So. Day? Yeah, this is over a period of five days. And the reason uh, I like to look at people over multiple days is because any single day could be an anomaly. And if someone has a day that's just not typical, it will its importance in the statistical analysis will be reduced. It will have less weight if you've got uh, you know four other days that that are more typical. So that's why I like to look at multiple days. Um, so, you know, you can always have people, we assume that people will have atypical dates, so we, we try to. Uh, Were any days better than others? Yeah, actually, I, I, in, uh, I have a paper where people are more bored on Mondays. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, that, that's actually consistent with what's called the Blue Monday effect. So some people have looked at people's mood on Monday. And they, you know, they tend to be in a less good mood on Monday, um, and so you know, bored because we find bored is correlated with bad mood. You would expect that. Yeah, uh, yeah go on. So there was one point where uh, focused work, people were less happy, and you gave the example of yeah. email. How about non-email focused work? Was that separated and checked into, or? So we haven't looked at that yet. So, you know, we have a mountain of data. <laughs> There's no end of, you know, ways that we can slice and dice and what perspectives we can use on the data. But because email happened to me, my focus, uh, that's what I looked at. But, uh, you know, of course, that's something that would be really interesting. Um, I have a question. Oh, I have Dana. Uh, it seems that people are bored when they're in a bad mood that those are correlated. Yes. Do you have any ideas? No, we, you know, it's you, without doing, let's say, a laboratory study, or you can do a, you, you know, it's even hard for this kind of uh, data collection to do um, a kind of uh, time correlated measure because I can look at time t and correlate it with time t plus one, right? And maybe they're, um, you know, they're bored at time t and in a bad mood at t plus one. But I don't know what precedes time t, right? I don't. So even if I start at the very beginning of the data collection, they might be in a bad mood to begin with, and I don't know what caused that. So it's really difficult. The only way you can really try and tease out this uh, causality idea is is really to do a laboratory experiment where you induce a condition that can create boredom and, and bad mood, right? So I'm looking at the slide where you say basically that you woke up for two minutes more and you're unhappy. And that leads to an immediate solution to our problem. If yeah. something we want people to be happy, they should focus on the work that doesn't use computers, which is completely new at this time. So my, what are your thoughts on that? Is there a way to make the way people work so there will be at least a reasonable part that is not done on computers in some manner? Can you guys say that the back? Uh, so his question was, is, or if you want to get it, uh, the question was, if, uh, if computers, people are generally all as happy while using them, maybe we should be moving into a world where we're not using them so often. And what are your thoughts on that? Okay. Well, um, the, the world is not going to go in that direction <laughs> at this point. But, um, I mean, I think there are ways that we can use digital media to make people happier. And, you know, I showed you the, the Facebook results. Right? People are happier when they're using Facebook. I think that we can explore ways that we might, you know, find, for example, social interactions to help make people happier, right? So rather than starting with the assumption that we get rid of computers to make people happy, pe we could get rid of computers and people may not be happy still, right? So, we, you know, let's think about what does make people happy and given that computing technology is not going to go away, let's think about how computing technology can make people happier. And so, you know, a starting point is to think about social interactions, right? 
Or, you know, we might explore other kinds of interventions that we can think of that, you know, maybe just simply asking people, take a break, right? Your, your attentional resources have, you know, they're at their threshold. So stop, go get some coffee or go meditate or whatever, right? Like coffee is not that given that you can't do modern work without computer. For instance, let's say you spend time reading articles online and responding to emails at the same time and all that blah blah. Instead, if you went to a library where the stuff you need to read was printed out for you on paper, like my dad used to do when he was a professor, you might end up reading the same stuff at the same time and being a champion. Yeah. Well, I mean I personally prefer reading hard copy material, uh, but you know there is a, t a cost in printing it out and, and there's killing trees and all that. So yeah, I mean, I, I think that we, that there's a lot of room for exploration for new solutions. And, and I'm not convinced that just put, you know, having people read hard copy is gonna make them happier because they still have a lot to read. It may not be the medium that they're using. It may be simply the amount that, that we're, you know, that we're looking at. We, it, so if you recall, we asked about valence. And let me, let me just show you that because I think, uh, this, okay, here we go. I, I think other people may, let's, So, so here, uh, whoops, no, no, you asked the right question. Uh, this is, uh, this horizontal axis is measuring mood. So this goes from positive, it's called affect, positive affect to negative affect. And here is state of arousal. This model is called Russell's uh, circumplex model of stress. And so if we just looked at this dimension, and we forget about this dimension, then we get a measure of mood. And that's where my happiness measures are coming from. And people were to click, you know, at whatever point in the grid best reflected how they felt. And so basically consider the mood dimension as collapsing the arousal dimension. Is that clear? Okay. Time for one more question. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Mark, just a question. In your analysis of the uh, technology work that you looked at, and you're looking at the uh, self-imposed interruptions versus the external interruptions, did you get any data in terms of which were work-related versus non-work-related interruptions in areas of particular interest that I found in my research? Yeah, no, that's, that's a fascinating uh, topic. No, we, we don't have that data, unfortunately. Um, I mean, we can sort of extrapolate. We're, you know, in, in uh, recent analyses of the data, you know, we're looking at Facebook use versus face-to-face -face versus email. Email is primarily work-related in the workplace. Facebook is primarily social-related. And so we can't capture all the social interruptions or all the work interruptions, but we can kind of, you know, look at these two cases, right? And, and we can look at differences that way. But unfortunately, we, we don't have the complete picture. That's, that's one of the, uh, the downsides of using sensors. It's a trade-off. You know, we did uh, ethnographies. You, you get this very rich collection of data. When you're doing sensors, you know, it's, it's great because it scales, it's less labor, but we lose contextual information. This, this, this information, I believe, it's in several published studies. Where can we find that? Yeah, you, you can go to my web page, click on the link that says research, and the papers at the top will have, yeah, I would say the first five or so papers will have uh, all of this. Great, thank you again. Um,